Uh, the second talk uh, speaker is a Professor Panya Das uh, Kavarkidis uh, from uh, UMass Amherst uh, from USA. Uh, we are happy to have him uh, here in this conference and thanks for accepting our invitations. Uh, let me uh, introduce the, the Professor Kavarkidis uh, shortly. Uh, he did his PhD at Lutgers University in uh, 2001, and he did a postdoc uh, careers in Princeton and the Los Alamos and there, and then started working in UMass and Amherst in 2001, and now is keep working there, and especially in the Department of the Mathematics. Uh, he's an American Physical Society Fellow in uh, 2014, and then a couple of years ago, uh, he became also a fellow in American Mathematical Society. Uh, he is an expert on the nonlinear dynamics and then solitons and the many quantum dynamics and so on. So I'm so happy to have him here together uh, uh, with us uh, today. So today, uh, the Professor Kubler Kiddes is talked about the, the multi-component nonlinear waves in optics and atomic condensate today. So thank you. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shin. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I would love to be in Korea one day, somehow when the whole COVID situation is over, uh, hopefully sometime in the future, but it's great to have that first opportunity to liaise. Uh, I also may apologize, there may be some construction sound in the background, but I hope you, I will be loud enough that you can't hear much of it. Uh, as yeah, I usually okay. say, uh, okay, good. So uh, as I usually say, this is work with a number of good friends and collaborators. Whatever good you see in here should be attributed to them. Whatever bad should be blamed on me. Um, we've done a number of things over the years on the subject, and I'll be happy to give specific references. But let me just out uh, highlight a, a sort of slightly dated review that we did on these topics, and happy to give specific references to anyone that may be interested in different things. Here's an overview of what I would like to talk about. So the main structure that I'm going to be interested in is called the dark bright solitons. I have to tell you what that is. And a cousin of it, which is called the dark dark solitons. I will start by introducing these in the simplest possible model, which is uh, something called the Manakov model. Then I will tell you something about what happens when we put these structures in parabolic traps, which is sort of a canonical thing that we do in these atomic Bose-Einstein condensates that uh, Jaiyun sort of very nicely introduced for me. Uh, then I will tell you something about scattering these waves from barriers. Uh, I will tell you something about bound states of the waves, what happens when we have multiple ones of these waves or possibly even lattices of these waves. I will also talk about a variant of the waves, which is called the dark anti-dark soliton. And then I will give you different kinds of variants, including higher number of spin states, so spinner systems that Jayun also uh, talked about, also higher dimensions, so what happens if you go to two dimensions, and then we'll see how far I get along that way. Uh, I don't think I need to give an introduction to this audience uh, about what Bose-Einstein condensates are. I just want, and Jayun did a great job in telling you about also multi-component systems. I just want to say that for the purposes of this talk, I want to restrict myself to a mean field limit, which means I want to have sort of a system that is cold enough and dilute enough, but with enough large of a number of atoms, such that the gross pitaevsky equation or a nonlinear Schrodinger equation with external potentials is the canonical model for much, most of what I want to tell you about. And since I mentioned the, non, the external potential, let me tell you something about the canonical potentials. The canonical potentials in one dimension can be parabolic potentials or periodic potentials, so-called optical lattice potentials. You can also have these kinds of parabolic or periodic potentials in 2D. And if you're daring enough, you can even have them in 3D. And I'll only be slightly daring and only maybe towards the end. And we'll see how far we get on that. But most of the story that I want to tell you about to keep things simple is in one dimension. And in one dimension, it turns out that that the most prototypical scenario for these nonlinear Schrodinger equations involves having the G being positive here. That means the interactions are self-repulsive. That means this is what we call in optics a self-defocusing medium. And when that happens, the canonical nonlinear structure that appears, the canonical solitary wave that appears, is a so-called dark soliton. That means that you have atoms on the left, you have atoms on the right, and then you have sort of a density dip in the middle. That dark spot is the reason why we call this the dark soliton. And in a one component setting, we know exact solutions in the absence of a trap of this sort. And these are these hyperbolic tangent type solutions. 
But as I told you, and as the as the talk title reveals, this is a multi-component talk. So I want to talk about situations where we have not just one component, but n running from one, two, three, and so on, multiple component systems. And when we have these multiple component systems, then we have a nonlinear Schrodinger equation for each one of the components. So n here runs in index one, two, three, and so on. And then these uh, species interact within themselves. Uh, let's say species one interacts with species one, species two interacts with species two, but also species one interacts with species two and so on and so forth. So there are uh, self interactions and cross interactions kind of coming into play. By the way, here, kind of like what Jay Yun showed, I am thinking of a single gas that is the masses of the two states of the two hyperfine states are the same. But you can also have situations, you can also envision situations where you have different masses. Let's say you have rubidium and sodium, and then the ratio of the masses will come in as an additional parameter. And I'll show you just one example of that, which I think is interesting. Now, because this is a community that involves a lot of condensed matter and atomic physicists, I do want to sort of bring up the fact that many of these structures that I want to talk about really came up in nonlinear optics experiments a while back. And so here I want to give you a prototypical example of that and, and show you the main structure. The main structure is exactly this kind of dark structure. So you have, think of having atoms here and atoms here and a dip in the middle. Uh, so this is the dark soliton in one component. And then there is a second component. And in that second component, the dark soliton creates a potential well that traps atoms only in the middle. So this is a dark state coupled to a bright state in the other component. The only difference is that this is not atoms, this is light, this is not atomic physics, it's optical physics. And what you see here is a photorefractive crystal that has two different polarizations of light. And what you're seeing is an experiment from the mid 90s from the group of Moti Segev and Zigang Chen and so on, where this dark soliton trapping a bright soliton, at least in terms of initial conditions, this is only initial condition for the moment, was done in this photorefractive crystal. In fact, light is given at the input phase of this crystal, and they look at the propagation and they measured the light at the output phase for these two polarizations in this photorefractive crystal. And it's interesting that they did three different experiments with that. This is the initial condition, if you will. This is the output of a very low density, very low intensity linear experiment. And if you have a linear experiment, things would just disperse away. They would not form solitons. They would just disperse away. When you have, this is one possibility that they examined. Here is another possibility where things are nonlinear, but are decoupled between this component and this component. So this component will form some dark solitons. This is an array of dark solitons. This is a bright beam, but there is no bright solitons in a defocusing medium. That's why this bright beam kind of disperses away. Okay, so it cannot form a dark bright soliton, but here is both nonlinear and coupled propagation between these two species. And that robustly shows that you make survive a state that has a dark soliton in the one component coupled to a bright soliton in the other component. That's my prototypical state, a dark bright soliton in this kind of optical two component medium. So when they had this success in the mid nineties in this experiment jointly with theory from Yuri Kipser's group, they then kind of proceeded to say, oh, if we can do one soliton, maybe we can do multiple solitons. And they actually tried to do two solitons. In fact, they tried to do two dark solitons. So you see the two dark spots over here, coupled to two bright solitons, which actually have a phase difference of pi. And I'll explain that in a little bit. So they created states that involved two dark bright solitons. And they affectionately call these solitonic gluons, interestingly enough. And here's the experiment. It's a fat dark beam coupled to two bright beams in antiphase, OK? And they input that to the optical crystal. Under linear propagation, nothing would survive. The whole thing would kind of disperse away. Under nonlinear but decoupled between the species propagation, the two darks would survive, the two brights would not, because you cannot have bright solitons in a defocusing medium. But when they had coupled and nonlinear propagation between the two species, they observed this pair, this bound state, this molecule, if you will, of these two dark bright solitons surviving in this mid 90s experiments, which I think was kind of a tour de force for that time. Now, fast forward 10 years, and let's come to atomic physics, since this is condensed matter solitons after all. 
Uh, in 2008, uh, the group of Klaus Engstock through the thesis of Christoph Becker was the first one that realized a situation like this in atomic physics, starting from the motivation from a paper from 2001 of Bush and Anglin. And here I'm not showing you Christoph Becker's thesis results. I'm showing you the work a little later than that of Peter Engels, because it's very telling. Here is a one dimension or a quasi one dimensional condensate. You can see a dip right here in the middle. That's a dark soliton in the one component. And you can see the second component is up here and it has a bright soliton, has this bright bump in the other species. So this is a dark bright soliton created in a quasi one dimensional atomic BC. And what you see is this guy over time oscillates in a very nice and benign way throughout a parabolic trap. So it traces a nice parabolic oscillation. That nice parabolic oscillation can be actually traced, the center can be traced uh, in this progression. And you can find the period as well as the amplitude of that vibration. And what you find when you measure that period and when you do it for different sizes of this bright soliton, different masses, of this bright soliton, you find something interesting that the world of the solitons is kind of similar to the real world uh, when you are fatter. When you are fatter, you move more slowly, and therefore the frequency of those oscillations for the fatter solitons is shorter, that is, the period is longer, that is, it takes them longer to vibrate throughout the trap. Okay, so this is an experimental observation coming from the group of Peter Engels of the oscillation frequency as the number of atoms changes increases in this vibration. Not only were they able to create one of them and see them vibrate in a trap, but they were also able to create two of them, see the quintessential soliton feature, a collision where the solitons would kind of nearly go through each other in a nearly elastic collision and so on and so forth. So these are experiments around 2009, 2010. And then, okay, then motivated by some discussions with us, they said, well, maybe we can actually create not just a single soliton, but actually multi-soliton configurations. But they did it in a very violent way. They were doing these so-called counterflow experiments where they were slamming two condensates at each other. This is early 2011, 2012, or there around. And this is a highly non-equilibrium situation but transiently within that highly non-equilibrium situation, if you look at particular pieces of that slamming event, that highly non-equilibrium event, you would see two dark solitons potentially trapping two bright solitons. You would potentially see three dark solitons potentially trapping three bright solitons, four dark solitons trapping four bright, and so on and so forth. They would see signatures or instances where multiple darks together with multiple brights would actually kind of come together. Of course, these were because of the nature of this slamming event, this would only be transient, but anyway, they could observe such features. Now, fast forward a couple more years around 2013, 2014, and Peter Engels is doing experiments with a, a barrier. So what he's now doing is he's putting a blue detuned laser beam, which is pushing away some atoms. Here, it's a, it's a small beam, it's a weak beam that pushes only a few atoms away, so it creates a weak barrier. Here, it's a much stronger beam that pushes a lot of atoms away and creates a strong barrier. And what he's doing is he's sending one, or in fact, many dark bright solitons onto this barrier. And so in the case where the solitons have a large enough kinetic energy and the barrier is shallow, they can overcome the barrier and go to the other side. So they are sort of scattering, but they are going through the barrier. Here, the barrier is too high. The kinetic energy of the solitons is low. It is not high enough to overcome the barrier. So they get reflected and they come back. So here you can see the solitons. They are coming, coming, hitting, but no chance. They are kind of getting reflected and are going back in this kind of scattering experiment. I think this is one of the very interesting things. I'll come back to that in my conclusion. But let me come back to this, the counterflow experiments. Around the same time, Peter Engels decided maybe it's a good idea not to do this very wild event where you slam the condensates onto each other. You do a more benign counterflow experiment. And when you do a more benign counterflow experiment, you would see other patterns as well. And here's an example of a different pattern. This is a pattern that has two components. One has a soliton to the right. And one has a soliton to the left. So it's as if these solitons are kind of conjoined, but they are kind of next to each other. They are not on top of each other. So this state he called the dark, dark soliton. Let me show you more about this state. That is in these experiments, he would see examples 
of the dark bright pattern, but he would also see examples of these conjoined solitons where the two states would have solitons, the red and the black, which are kind of sitting next to each other. These solitons are called dark, dark solitons. He observed them. And what I'll try to do is rationalize to, to you that these should also be there. These are kind of cousins of the dark, bright solitons. So this is around 2013, 2014. Now I fast forward a couple more years. This is 2016 now. And these are experiments not in nearly miscible or immiscible fluids, but rather on miscible fluids or much more strongly miscible fluids. And here you have two components that are miscible. So you can see that they are miscible and there is a dark soliton on the one and that creates a bump. It creates again a potential well that traps a number of atoms in the other component. So it's a bright soliton in the other component, but it's not a bright soliton on top of zero. It's a bright soliton on top of a background. And in nonlinear wave theory, we call these solitons anti-dark. And so this is an example of a dark, anti-dark soliton. By the way, these guys also oscillate nicely inside the trap and Peter Engels could monitor these oscillations in 2016. And here's just to make the distinction between a dark bright and a dark anti-dark. In a dark bright, there is a dark in the one component and the bright has no support on the two sides. It's just a bump. Whereas in the dark anti-dark, you have a dark in the one component and the bright is on top of a background. It's, it's on top of a miscible second component effectively, okay? Just to make the distinction. So that's 2016. Now I'm coming to Jaehyun's spinners. So this is 2018 now, and this is a spinner condensate in three components. So one, zero and minus one, just like Jaehyun was telling us. And this is a three component solitary wave, which can be dark, dark and bright. So you can see the cross sections, dark, dark and bright. And, or it can be dark in the one component and bright in the two others. This is a dark, bright, bright. So this is dark, dark, bright. And this is dark, bright, bright. These were realized again by Peter Engels in 2018. Fast forward a couple more years, another experiment. Now the thesis of Stefan Lanning in Heidelberg uh, which creates these dark, bright, bright solitons, these spinner solitons, three component solitons in a very, very controlled way. And he can see basically what he does is he does a localized Rabi coupling. He transfers atoms from the zero state to the plus one and minus one. But if he does that without a phase gradient, without creating a dark soliton in this component, then the thing will not survive. Over time, it will sort of disperse away. But if he does create a pair of dark solitons in the zero component, these dark solitons can keep surviving the bright solitons. They can sustain the bright solitons in the other two components. So you create a pair of dark, bright, bright solitons. So this is three component solitons. We can even compare them with the analytical solution of this Manakov model and we can find good agreement, but I'll tell you more about the theory and, and, and the collisions of these guys in a little bit later. Uh, for now, I'm just giving you sort of the history of the subject. And this is hot of the press. It has not appeared in the archive yet. I hope it will appear within the next month. This is a dark, bright soliton lattice, or perhaps more appropriately, a train of dark, bright solitons. This is the work of Peter Engels uh, with us again. And here you have a whole lattice of dark, bright solitons, and you have an interpenetrating lattice of the second species. So you have dark solitons in the one where you have bright in the other, and you have dark solitons in the first where you have bright in the second. So it's a, a lattice of interpenetrating solitons. Each one of these dips have a pi phase shift so, or near pi phase shift. So these are dark bright solitons and they use a two pulse Ramsey method together with a weak magnetic field and some crucially winding time, some waiting time to create structures of different wave numbers. Depending on that winding time, you can actually control something about the wave number of the solitons. If you wait for about 20 milliseconds, for example, if Peter waits and Sean Mossman who did these experiments, if they wait for about 20 milliseconds, they create a lattice with larger distances, larger wavelength. If they wait 60 milliseconds, they create lattices with shorter, 100 milliseconds, even shorter wavelengths and so on. So they can controllably create these trains of dark bright solitons and observe their dynamics. And that's, in my, to my understanding, a first of doing that kind of thing. 
Okay, so I told you a lot about experimental history. Every slide that I showed you so far was an experimental slide for the history of these two and three component solitary waves. Now let me try to come back one by one and explain why these states should be there, how they emerge, what happens to them, and so on and so forth. And I'll start at the beginning. The beginning was a single dark bright soliton, and the beginning was this kind of multi-component theoretical model. For a moment, let me scratch up the trap. I will tell you what happens in the trap in a little bit. So let's set V to zero momentarily. And let's remember that in rubidium, when you look at scattering lengths in the two different hyperfine states, uh, you can see that these scattering lengths are nearly equal. And so I will assume being, I'll put my theorist hat and assume that these are essentially equal because in that limit, we actually know from integrable theory that there exists a dark bright soliton. In fact, we even know an analytical form for it. We know that it's a tangent, a hyperbolic tangent in the one component coupled to a hyperbolic secant in the other component. This is an exact result. This solitary wave, just like usual solitary waves, has a width that is controlled by D. Here is like the inverse width, has a center position, it has a velocity which is controlled by K or this phase phi. It has a bright component that is controlled by this amplitude eta. And something that may not look too important to you, but will be important in what I follow with this phase of the bright component theta. So that's an exact solution. You can basically show that this satisfies the equations of motion. So a dark bright soliton should definitely exist. But what about this more exotic state, the dark dark soliton? Well, one of the interesting features of this Manakov model is that it is invariant under SU2 rotations. So these rotations leave the equations of motion invariant. Therefore, if I rotate the solution of the dark bright soliton, if I perform a rotation, which kind of mixes the two components, then I should still get a solution of the same equations. So that creates this kind of state over here. And because I'm a simple guy, let me not even uh, consider unitary rotations. Let me just consider orthogonal rotations. So the favorite cos delta minus sine delta, sine delta, cos delta, I just rotate the state by an angle delta. And what I will write for you, although it's going to be a little complicated, is the measurable quantity, the density of atoms of these two species. And I want you to pay attention to two specific properties of these rotated states. One property is that one state has cos squared delta, where the other has sine squared delta. This means that if delta is pi over 4, where the cos is equal to the sine, this will look symmetric. Whereas if delta is different than pi over 4, then they will look asymmetric. That's one thing to pay attention to in the next slide. The second thing to pay attention to is remember the amplitude of the bright soliton was eta. So this eta comes into play over here. But in this term that involves the eta, there is this time dependent phase of the bright component. That means that contrary to what we know about regular solitons, regular solitons have a density that is fixed in time. These funny solitons have a density that will actually be time dependent. It should be breathing in some way in time. And I will show that to you in a little bit. So these are the two features, the symmetry versus asymmetry, pi over four versus different than pi over four, and time dependent density if eta is non-zero that I want you to pay attention to when I show you the actual picture, because the picture is much more telling than these uh, bizarre equations. So the situation with delta different than pi over four, asymmetric, is shown on the left. The situation with delta equal to pi over 4, symmetric, you will see these are much more symmetric as shown on the right. So you can see the asymmetry versus symmetry. Also, the situation where eta is non-zero, that has a bright component, is shown on the top. And the situation with eta equal to zero is shown on the bottom. Now, the situation on the bottom is much closer to what you would think of as a dark, dark soliton. That is, two dark solitons that are collocated with each other. On the other hand, if eta is non-zero, you create a situation where the dark solitons are not collocated. They're kind of next to each other. They are adjacent to each other. And that situation is much more akin to what we saw in the experimental results of Peter Engels over here. So the SO2, SU2 rotations of these dark bright solitons give us a base to understand the existence of these dark, dark solitons that exist in these two component systems as well. But as I told you, and keep this in mind, 
that these dark, dark solitons are not stationary. In fact, what they do is they kind of funnily interpenetrate with each other. So they keep going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Their density is vibrating in time, contrary to what we're kind of used to for regular solitons like these guys, where the density is always time invariant. We'll come back to that in just a second. So, so far, I have explained for you that dark bright solitons should exist in these models. And because of rotations, dark dark solitons also observed in experiments should also exist in these models. But remember that the experiments have a trap. And so as I promised, I'm coming back to the presence of a trap. So what happens to these waves when you have a trap? I will make a transformation to throw everything that involves the trap to understand that to the right hand side so this right hand side involves the potential possibly the derivatives of the potential but i throw everything that involves the potential to the right hand side and then on the left i have my favorite manakov model and on the right i have the perturbation involving the trap and then i will play the following game i will say okay for the left model i know it has a soliton it's a dark bright soliton in fact i know i can plug this soliton into the hamiltonian into the energy of this model and i can compute the energy of a dark bright soliton it will depend on its inverse width it will depend on chi which is the number of bright atoms it will depend on the speed but it will depend on the properties of the dark bright soliton its energy will depend on its own properties so then i can play the following game what does the trap do to this soliton well, it makes it a time dependent soliton, that is, its properties like the width or the center of mass will move, will change over time, but the soliton will preserve its structural form. So it will still be a soliton, but now its parameters, like its speed and its width, will depend now on time. So the soliton will be time dependent. If it's time dependent, I can calculate the rate of change of its energy over time. I can compute it explicitly based on the expression for its energy on the left hand side. But remember, this is a soliton under the effect of these perturbations. So I can actually, in the way of a moment equation, I can see how this energy will change over time because of the right hand side, because of the perturbations. And when I balance the two, when I balance these two rates of change of the energy, I will get myself a strange looking, ugly looking equation of motion, however, for the solitary wave. And one of the beautiful things that you see immediately here is that when the solitary wave, sorry, when the trap has a, a, a minimum, for example, or a maximum, then the soliton should be in equilibrium. So you can find the solitary wave equilibrium at the bottom of the trap. And then you can say, okay, let me assume that the soliton moves around this equilibrium and executes a vibration or an oscillation around this equilibrium. Then you can linearize around this equilibrium. And in the end of the day, extract a simple, harmonic oscillator expression for the motion of this soliton inside that trap. And that oscillation will tell you the following thing. It, the frequency of that oscillation is omega over square root of two, which is the known result about the frequency of a dark soliton in the trap, minus something that depends on the number of bright atoms. That is, the frequency of the soliton is downshifted because of the presence of the bright soliton. The frequency of the soliton, sorry, is downshifted. It decreases the more bright atoms you have. So here is my dark bright soliton in a trap. Its tails are chopped off because of the trap. Here's the dark, here's the bright, and its frequency is downshifted. And remember what the experiment showed. Peter Engels' experiment showed that the frequency is downshifted with the number of atoms in the bright component. So the more bright atoms you have, the lower the frequency, the higher the period of that vibration. So this little analysis around the equilibrium point can show you that the dark bright soliton will have this kind of feature. And what about the dark dark soliton in the trap? I talked about dark bright, how about the dark dark? Well, the trap does not care about SU2 rotations either. Therefore, the dark dark soliton will also vibrate in a trap. So here is the one component, and here's the other component of the dark, dark soliton vibrating in the trap. And the, it vibrates with the same frequency. Here's the analytical prediction in red. Here's the computational results in the inverted triangles. And you see there is great agreement about how the frequency of vibration decreases with the number of bright atoms. Remember, this was what was seen in the experiment. But I'm showing you this to make you see that the dark, dark soliton is not stationary. It, you see there is the oscillation of the thing in the trap, 
but there is this internal vibration, black, red, black, red, black, red. So it interpenetrates as it moves inside the trap. So it's time, it's density is time dependent. It is not stationary over time, okay? So that's, that's the dark, dark soliton in the trap. So, so far, dark, bright and dark, dark without the trap, but also dark, bright and dark, dark in a trap. Now, what about more than one? I told you that people look at the solitonic gluons at multiple dark brights. How can these come about? In order to understand this, since we don't have any, a simple exact solution, let me take two dark solitons, the minus and the plus, and two bright solitons coupled with them, again, the minus and the plus. Now for the dark solitons, the phase is kind of all set. I cannot change it. But for the bright solitons, one of the very interesting things that is known also from works of Randy Hewlett and others is that their interaction depends on the relative phase. So let me impose a relative phase delta theta between these bright components. If I put something like this as an answer, as a trial solution to the energy of the system, I will get that the energy of this pair of solitons is twice the energy of a single soliton, what would happen if they were by themselves. But then there is an interaction of a dark of the first piece with the dark of the second, an interaction of the bright of the first piece with the bright of the second, and a cross interaction of the dark with the bright. So all of these energy pieces will be there. And if I calculate the gradients with respect to the, the position, I will get the corresponding forces. And here's what you learn if you calculate the corresponding forces. The key thing to look at is these exponential. These exponential forces between the dark and the dark are always repulsive. That is, darks repel each other. The interaction of the brights is crucially dependent on the relative phase. If the brights are in antiphase for this repulsive media, it turns out that they attract. If they are in phase for this defocusing media, it turns out they repel. So how about this? Let's put together two darks that repel. Let's put together two brights that attract. So at short distances, the darks win with their repulsion. At long distances, the brights win with their attraction. And so together, they form an effective potential that has a local minimum. That local minimum is an equilibrium position. It is a bound state. It is the molecular state of a dark, bright, soliton pair, which exists as an exact solution even without any trap in this system. That is, the repulsion of the darks and the attraction of the brights can conspire in just the right way at just the right distance to create this kind of molecular state. Not only can we measure that equilibrium distance, but in this potential, this dark bright pair will actually vibrate out of phase. This is the out of phase motion of the two dark brights. The two dark brights can move in phase with zero, this is like a Goldstone mode when they move in phase, but they can also vibrate out of phase with respect to each other. And we can measure all of that because of these exact expressions. This reproduces the result that Moti Segev and Yuri Kivsar had found uh, a long time ago about the existence of these dark bright soliton pairs, these solitonic gluons as they call them in these optical experiments and similar experiments, as I told you, happened later in BCs. If you put these things in a trap, then you have an additional oscillation. You have the oscillation of the pair in phase in the trap. And of course, you have the oscillation out of phase of the pair in the trap. And you can measure each one of these oscillations. You can characterize them analytically and, and compare these with the numerical results. So that's the dark bright pair. But in a trap, more can happen. And why? Because as I told you, the darks repel if you put the brights in phase, the brights repel too. But you see the trap doesn't care. It brings everything back. It has a restoring force. And so in a trap, you can even have two darks and two brights with the brights being in phase. So even that is a solution inside the trap. And if you can do two, you can also do three. Here is two, three darks together with three brights in phase. Here's three darks with three brights. The brights are out of phase and so on and so forth. So you can create uh, bound states, molecular states of more than two solitary waves in this context. Uh, and we have seen this not only in one dimension, if I have maybe a little bit of time at the end, I will even show you some 3D movies. We have even seen them in the fully 3D glory of, of these situations. And you can see dark brights repelling like here and dark, dark brights attracting like there, depending on the, on the nature of the relative phase of the bright components.
Um, and so this reproduces the result that Peter Engels had, although that was a transient result, that these multiple dark brights can exist in the system. And if you can have two, and if you can have three, why not have whole lattices of these dark bright solitons? So in theory, in the theoretical analysis of these systems, we know that there are conoidal wave functions, these elliptic function solutions that generalize these to periodic structures. So these are lattices of these dark bright solitons. And so here is an SN solution, an elliptic SN function, an elliptic CN function, which are solutions of this system of two no Nonlinear Schrodinger equations provided some uh, conditions are met. And these solutions will look like this. Here is a lattice of darks coupled to a lattice of brights in the SNC and the brights are in antiphase. So there exists a lattice like that, but you can also have the so-called SNDN solution. And then the darks are coupled to brights and the brights can even be in phase in the entire lattice. And so I can explain more about why that is, but both of these solutions exist. And so we kind of prompted Peter Engels to try to create these kinds of lattices. And so this is the result that I told you is hot off the press. It has not even appeared yet, where he was able to create this dark bright soliton train and, and a complementary train in the other component. As I said, you can actually control depending on the winding time, the length scale of this train. And let me tell you something about the dynamics of this train. Here is the dynamics. What you can see is the train survives. This is a Fourier mode, uh, a Fourier uh, or a picture about the amplitude of the Fourier mode. So what you can see is the structure survives for a long time. And then after a while, it seems to get destroyed for a bit. But then it actually gets to revive itself. So there is kind of a recurrence of the structure. It survives already for time scales of the order of 30 to 40 milliseconds, depending on the, on the experiment. And it sort of goes away for a little bit. It blurs out. And then it revives itself. Here's the experiment. It survives, survives, survives. Then it seems to get distorted. And then it kind of reappears uh, strong again in these experiments of, of Peter Engels. These are the very latest experiments that I have to report for you. So, OK, so I told you a lot about one, two, three, many dark bright solitons. Now let me go to a little bit of twists on the problem. One twist that I want to tell you about is trapping higher excited states. I told you about the dark trapping a bump, which is the ground state of the bright component. What about trapping higher excited states? Well, if you look at the theory, in order to do that, you cannot have this ratio of the masses of the two species be one. You need it to be less than two over n times one plus n if you want to excite a higher excited state with n equal one or n equal two or n equal three. So n equal one requires d less than one, n equal two requires d less than one third, n equal two requires d less than one sixth and so on and so forth. But if the ratio of the masses is different than one, you can prove theoretically that you can trap not only a ground state, but a dark soliton can trap a first excited state. A dark soliton can trap a second excited state or even a third excited state provided that you play with the ratio of the masses. So this is something that to my knowledge has not been experimentally sought yet. It's a, it's a very interesting, I think, uh, feature, uh, but that's kind of the theoretical demonstration that it can happen. Let me mention something about the spinners. So Jayun showed us some very interesting stories about spinners. I will focus a little bit more on the solitons for the spinners. So here's the spinner system. It has its density dependent interactions and it has its uh, spin dependent interactions. So this one plus minus one gives two zeros that Jayun talked to us about. And in this context, I, we had uh, suggested in 2008 that these dark, dark bright and dark bright bright solitons can exist. That is, we had done some reductions. Let me not take you through the algebra, but we had done some reductions to show that the two components, the plus one and minus one, could have, for example, a dark soliton, and the third could have a bright, or one component would have a dark, and the other two could have a bright. And then Peter and we also showed that these guys could oscillate in a very nice way inside the trap. And Peter Engels showed that these guys were indeed possible. That is, you could have dark, dark bright solitons and dark bright bright solitons. This was in a paper in 2018. But really, a major breakthrough happened through a 2020 work of Marcus Obertaler, who actually created multiple pairs of these dark bright solitons, dark bright bright solitons. So these are three component solitons. He created one pair over here and another pair over here. These are the experiments of Stefan Lanning, 
and the inner pairs would actually come together and collide. And the interesting feature about collisions of three component dark bright brights, which can never happen in two components, is there is something called the polarization of the solitons. This is how many atoms exist in the two bright species. And so here we have two solitons where the atoms on the bright species are perfectly equal. But after the collision, you see that there is something that looks like a symmetry breaking. The polarization changes. This soliton has more atoms in plus one than it has in minus one. And this soliton has more atoms in minus one than it has in plus one. So there is kind of a change of the relative size of the polarization, as we call it in this context, of the soliton. And this is controlled by the relative phase of the incoming solitons. In fact, there is integrable theory about this by Barbara Prinari and Gino Biondini that predicts a sort of sinusoidal dependence on the relative phase of this change of polarization. And the experiment of Marcus and his group spot on without any free parameters that produces that change of polarization, that symmetry breaking as a function of the relative phase of the two solitons. So that's a theoretical result down here that matches without free parameters, the experimental result up there. So that's an interesting feature, but for these um, dark, dark, bright and dark, bright, bright, this is the graph that uh, Jai Hyun showed you about the different states of a spinner system as a function of the spin dependent interaction of the quadratic Zeeman. And we have mapped actually together with CMOS that he mentioned also uh, the solitons, the dark, dark, bright or dark, bright, bright solitary waves that can exist in this kind of system. Um, let me mention a couple, I don't know how much time I have, maybe a minute or two, uh, Professor Shin. Yes, uh, two minutes, yes. Uh, okay. Two minutes. Okay, so let me just, yeah, let me just uh, mention a couple of very quick developments and sum up. One very recent development in the group of Jean Dalibar is he showed that these multi component systems, if you have a minority component and a majority component, can be converted to an effective one component system with an effective interaction that depends on essentially this immiscibility parameter. And the beauty of this is that if you're in an immiscible regime, the minority component can actually have an effectively attractive interaction. So when you have an effective attractive interaction, what he was able to create, Jean Dalibar was able to create the so-called town soliton in two dimensions. We took this idea one dimension down and proposed to create a structure which is very elusive, the so-called peregrine soliton, a structure that is not exponentially localized, but power law localized in this effective one component medium. I think this is a very interesting experiment to be. So, uh, and we have demonstrated that this Peregrine soliton can actually, this localized state, not in space, not in time, but in space time, can actually be realized in numerical experiments. It has not been done as of yet in experiments. So that's an interesting feature. Um, we have done a lot of work in higher dimensions in the interest of time. Let me not talk about higher dimensions, although this connects to skirmions, but rather just sum up what I have told you so far. So let me skip a lot of higher dimensional stuff and just sum up what I just told you. I told you that these guys, these dark bright solitons are canonical states that appear in experiments in these two component media. Variants of these, cousins of these, the dark darks can also exist. We can predict the motions of these guys in a trap. We can predict why bound states of these can exist. We can generalize these bound states to lattice states. And then we can create all sorts of twists, including trapping higher excited states, including playing with the effective interactions between the media to create this peregrine, including, although I didn't show you, generalizing all of these states to higher dimension. So I think a lot has been done, but there is plenty still to do. Understanding the scattering that I told you about with the barrier is, is a very interesting topic. Many of the things that I told you, like trapping higher excited states or uh, creating this peregrine and so on, have not been realized experimentally. And understanding the spinner solitons, as Jai Hume said, is kind of a frontier. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again. Gam uh, Samnida. Thank you for your interesting and enthusiastic talk for the, the dynamics of the multi, multiple soliton complex. OK, so. Uh, Although we have a short time, but uh, I think we can take a one or two questions. Yeah, Sokbom, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, about the last part of your talk, I mean, can you, I mean, is it possible to uh, have like, yeah, lattice of peregrine soliton 
And if so, uh, what would be the collective mode of the such lattice? Uh, that's a tricky one. First, I would love to see a single one, to be honest with you. But in theory, it is possible. So there is two variants of this. And actually, there's a beautiful movie that I'm happy to send to you, which exists in the internet. There is two variants of these uh, peregrines. One variant is a spatial periodic version of the peregrines. That's called the Akhmediev breather. And then there is a time periodic version of this, which is called the Kuznetsov mass soliton. So both of these existing theories, so the theoretical prediction of the nonlinear Schrodinger type equations give us such states. Uh, now, doing excitations on top of that is tough, especially with these guys, because they only appear at a certain moment in time and then they disappear. So I'm not thinking of excitations. You cannot linearize or BDG around them so easily. But even being able to generate this and see what the experimental perturbations would do to these states, to be honest with you, uh, realizing things like that would be lovely in, in BC. So I would be very happy if experimentalists took up this challenge. And I would be very happy to talk to them about that as well. OK, thank you very much. OK, the, the last question is uh, Jane. Uh, I, I saw you handed up. Uh, OK, please, maybe it's the absent. Okay. Actually, I have a one question. I mean, it is interesting to hear that uh, dark brighton and dark dark soliton can be interconverted through that the SU2 or SO2 rotations. So then can we think of some type of intermediate state in between them I and mean, changing the, the, the mixing angle between the two or and then some third type yes. of... Uh, yeah, yeah. I think you can do this. In theory, I only showed you the I only showed you the symmetric case somehow, but you mm -hmm. can actually, in principle, vary this angle, and then varying the angle, you can create different uh, asymmetric versions thereof. I should also say that uh, although the dark dark have been realized in experiments, in fact, here let's see. I wanted to show you maybe the the oscillation in the trap. Their oscillation in the trap, the time scale of the oscillation in the trap is short and needs to be controlled in order to show that the density is time dependent. It has never been shown experimentally that their density is time dependent. So both the asymmetry has not been controllably explored, nor has the, the interpenetration of them been experimentally shown. So both of these would be very interesting things to show. And I should also say one more thing. When we were doing experiments with dragging an obstacle through a, 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 the BEC in a two component medium, Below a certain threshold with the first speed of sound, you would generate sort of regular dark brights. But if you go beyond a certain threshold, we would see things that look like the dark darks. So that might be an avenue to pursue in order to generate them in a spontaneous way, rather than trying to seed them in a very special way. Although seeding them may be interesting too with, with phase imprintings, but, but also dragging an obstacle may be interesting as well. So uh -huh. just okay. something to think about and, and happy to discuss about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, is, uh, time's up. So, uh, okay, then uh, it's a wonderful talk and a wonderful session. So uh, let's thank that the, all the speakers, Jayun and then uh, uh, Nadis, and then with a big hand. Okay, thank you. <laughs>